All right, good morning. Uh, thank you for allowing me to come and speak. Uh, it's a privilege to be here. So uh, this is a talk basically that's going to look at uh, some of the aspects of regenerative medicine and abdominal wall reconstruction. And uh, this is a picture of uh, Prometheus, of course, was a, a moral titan. And he uh, basically stole fire and made uh, the image and, and, and form of man. Uh, and basically this, of course, uh, upset Zeus, who was the king of God, the gods, and basically he uh, chained uh, Prometheus to Mount Olympus every day. And then he, as an eagle, came and devoured his liver. And then every night his liver would regenerate. And so I, I see this as sort of a very compelling uh, uh, corollary to, to the patients that we take care of. And essentially, we, the surgeons, are the eagle. And ultimately, uh, every night we come and we take care of these recurring uh, hernias, like, like the liver that regenerated. So, so I have no disclosures. And my comments are my own personal opinions, not the policy of the Informed Services or the Department of Defense. So my aims are to give a brief history of abdominal oil reconstruction, discuss current evidence relative to regenerative technologies in abdominal reconstruction, and also to discuss some of the contemporary alternative technologies in abdominal oil reconstruction. So what is regenerative medicine? It's a field of science that aims to replace or regenerate human cells, tissues, and organs with the goal of restoring and we're reestablishing form and function. In antiquity, uh, abdominal wall hernias were mentioned as early as 1500 BC, where the authors of the Ebers papyrus uh, described hernias coverings of the brow, the abdomen. And they actually talked about treatment where they said that the patients should fall to the ground, where they would induce reduction, and then they should apply heat to imprison the hernia in the belly. In the Greco Roman period, uh, Surgeons like Celsus in the first century described gastroraphy, which is a technique of closure of the abdominal wall, and Galen of Permagon, one of the most famous uh, surgeons of this period, described a technical description of mass abdominal closure, as well as he understood that there were complications related to incisional hernias. Fast forward to the Dark Ages. This was basically an age of faith and scholasticism, and the techniques of abdominal wall closure from the past had basically been lost. In the 18th century, in the age of the anatomist, Surgeons like Le Chassier of France, who were first to define ventral hernia, and Pierre Nicolas Gerdy performed the first incisional hernia repair. In 1910, Kircher, 1912, Judd, and Lowell, 1913, described variations on autografting of tissues to repair ventral hernias. In the 1920s, Gibson and Natal described a rectus muscle transplant technique. These were all early precursors of our current biologic prostheses, except the outcomes were unfortunately poor. So fast forward to the age, uh, the period after the World Wars in the 1950s, uh, the age of plastics is born. And Banks and Hogan, working for the Chevron Corporation, essentially uh, discovered high-density polypropylene, otherwise known to us as Marlex mesh. So in the modern era, essentially, uh, surgeons like Jean Reeves and Rene Stilpa had advanced the art and science of uh, mesh hernia repair when they developed the open retrorectus abdominal hernia, uh, open retrorectus abdominal wall reconstruction. And they really were the ones that brought this to, to the uh, level that we have today. Iqbal et al. From in, in 2007 basically reviewed the Mayo Clinic studies where they looked at 254 complex incisional hernia repairs. And they were able to basically describe uh, what, what, what I can consider to be the top of, 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 of the technology. And essentially, they were able to show that their 30 day mortality was 0%, a morbidity of 13%, and they had a low recurrence of 5%. And their overall follow-up was 70 months. So this uh, demonstrated that this technique was very good and could uh, essentially uh, provide an excellent re result. So despite the excellent results with this reeves stopa repair, it is relatively contraindicated in contaminated surgical fields, such as fistulas or ostomy takedowns. So up to this point, the main options for managing contaminated abdominal wall reconstructions were really a staged approach where you would take care of the contaminated field, then uh, plan a ventral hernia, lay in a, a vicral mesh or a skin graft, and then bring the patient back later, or essentially no operation. But this was about to change with the introduction of biologic mesh. So the biologic mesh year really began somewhere around 2003 when uh, studies began to show up in the Journal of Trauma, for example, uh, where uh, Researchers in Cook County in Chicago realized that, uh, borrowing from e evidence in the burn surgery literature, that you could take some of these human acellular dermis 
products, and they used it in a, in a model of high-risk ventral hernia repair, and essentially they compared it to Gore-Tex mesh, which was a standard option at that time in 2003. And what they were able to show was that when you incorporated these ventral hernias with biologic mesh, the mesh was able to be epithelialized and to demonstrate fibroblast ingrowth. And compare that to the, the Gore-Tex mesh, which basically showed no evidence of ingrowth and was really just infected. Uh, additionally, uh, authors such as Hong et al. from the University of Utah also were able to show early on that in their experience with 29 patients where they used a underlay technique of human acellular dermis, where they then applied a component separation, they were able to show actually very excellent results uh, and showed that essentially overall they had uh, excellent results and were able to do a one-stage repair. And so they really said in their conclusions that otherwise if these patients had not been, uh, biologic mess had not been used to repair these patients, they otherwise would have had to coexist with their infections, undergo a mesh excision, and be left with their ventral hernia. So I think this was an early indicator of, of a new technology and what they considered to be a, a very valid uh, advance in the practice. So very quickly thereafter, uh, many of the in industrial players out there, uh, here's LifeCell, Covidian, Bard, Synovus, and Cook, they all basically came into the marketplace and, and in my opinion, made very uh, uh, bold claims, essentially saying that these products would be used in an infected field. In 2008, uh, many of the thought leaders in hernia surgery began to sort of endorse these products. And so here are some, some of these uh, uh, thought leaders basically saying that when, when asked about when should you use a biologic mesh, uh, in other words, when is the benefit outweigh the risk and the cost, they felt that, that essentially here Bellows et al., for example, said the clear indication for use of biologic mesh is contaminated or potentially contaminated fields. Here Fitzgibbon said without any question the best indication for the use of biologic mesh is in a contaminated field. And finally Dr. Voller said well, we're trying to figure this question out, but essentially this is what's commonly thought today is that we can use these meshes uh, in, in, the, in the place of contamination where the synthetic mesh may not be an adequate product. And this is when I most often use it. This is a, a snapshot from the SAGE's uh, wiki page. It looks at ventral hernia. And again, it gives some sense of the complexity of all the uh, varied products in the market. It's broken down by brand, by company, by type, whether it be uh, dermis, subucosal intestine, uh, pericardium. It's, it breaks it down based on whether it's from human or bovine or porcine, cross-linking, non-cross-linking, sterilization versus non-sterilization. And ultimately, it's a very confusing, I think, uh, uh, slide that, that ultimately kind of gives a sense of just how, how difficult it is to decide what products and when we should use these products. So we in the military, just like our civilian counterparts, uh, we, we jumped into the biologic mesh arena like, like any good soldier would. And our, our, our desire was basically to give good outcomes to our patients. You know, the patients from Iraq and Afghanistan essentially uh, came back with devastating uh, wounds. Some of them had direct injury to the abdominal wall. And so we needed a better way to take care of these complex open abdomens. And essentially, uh, once, once we initially had were presented with these problems. We used a overlay of Marlex mesh after we had done a delayed closure, but eventually once the biologic mesh became available, we quickly adopted this and replaced the, the plastic mesh. And these are examples of patients uh, that, that have the multi-system injuries, amputations, open abdomens. Uh, the patient on the left is a patient with an infected abdominal wall. He's got a urostomy in place, a, a colostomy, so very complex and challenging patients. I'll say anecdotally that in my experience, although we have some data and follow-up on this, uh, overall there were high uh, perioperative complications and the long-term recurrence, certainly with the human products, was poor. So at the end of this decade, in 2010, essentially the companies, I think, uh, tended to, to change some of their uh, perspectives and they, they broke it down based on xenograft versus allograft. Again, the cross-linking versus non-cross-linking issue became available, but again, not really helping to, to clear up for us surgeons in terms of when to use the product or what, what, what the proper indication was for. So until recently, given the experience of the last decade, the literature and the surgical practice supported biologic mesh as a go-to product for use in complex, high-risk abdominal wall reconstructions. But most recently, there's been several attempts at meta-analysis, and I think uh, uh, valid attempts really to look at the very specific issue of whether or not we can legitimately use a biologic mesh in a contaminated field. So I'm going to go through several studies here, and then I'm going to quickly su summarize what my thoughts are on this. So essentially here, Atani et al. from Boston University in 2012 presented a study uh, which looked at a meta-analysis of, of all the existing literature. 
And right from the get-go, what he brings up is this idea that these products are not FDA approved, that they have undergone a separate approval process, which is the 510K approval process. And this uh, essentially only places the burden on the manufacturer to show safety, but does not make any uh, claim or, or does not sh uh, force them to basically show efficacy. And that's really the situation we're in today. So essentially, he looked at eight studies, 635 patients. They were both human and porcine meshes. There's unfortunately no level one data. The follow-ups were short. Recurrences were high at 21% and morbidity at 20%. Essentially, he said that despite the lack of FDA approval for use in contaminated fields, biologic mesh continues to be used with poor outcomes. And he really called for the surgical community and funding agencies to undertake prospective randomized trials to properly direct the use of these products. Here, Janice et al. Uh, from uh, <clears throat> Texas essentially did another attempt at meta-analysis. He did, uh, though, break it down based on factors that he thought were associated to recurrence. And what he found was that overall recurrence was as high as up to 80%. Of course, this is usually related to the human experience where you've not been able to close it. So in, in the acellular dermal uh, human experience, we've seen very high recurrences. Uh, when you break it down based on type, whether it be porcine or human or bovine, again, you see that high uh, human number in terms of 100% recurrence. But I think more realistically what you see is in the porcine uh, environment, 15% and in bovine up to 20%. So that one, one out of five uh, number really reigns true in all these studies. Trying to break it down based on whether the location or the type or the type of suture used, none of these other factors really were, were, were valid in, in terms of making a strong conclusion about how, how to best optimize the outcomes. And essentially they said ultimately that their use in, the use of biologic mesh is really yet to be determined in infected fields. These are expensive adjuncts, they have high recurrence rates, and they really called for high uh, quality studies to help us make the decisions and, and decide when the, when the use of these products would be most beneficial. Here, uh, Bellows et al., he made another attempt at, at meta-analysis, and what he basically found was there were 60 papers that, that were available. There's again no level one data, and he found up to 50% of these cases occurred in contaminated fields. 80%, 87% of the cases had at least one complication, and the mean FOP was short. And again, that recurrence number of up uh, of 15%, really one out of five, uh, range true in these cases. Again, they called for prospective studies. They said that really there's no evidence. Uh, to support biologic mesh use in, in complex abdominal wall reconstructions, certainly in infected fields. And they asked that we use exceed, exceedingly amounts of caution, essentially, and called for better design and reported studies. So lastly, Aristotle from the University of California, San Francisco, he attempted a meta-analysis, and what he found essentially was, again, surgical site infection rates, of, which were very high, up to 60%, recurrence rates up to 50%, and follow-up, again, being short, uh, 18 months, up to 18 months. And he broke it down into four major conclusions. First, he says, essentially, that all the evidence that exists within the literature really does not support the claims that these products are better than, bio, uh, than synthetic meshes. He said, second, that essentially, given, given the preponderance of evidence and really the fact that they're only 510K uh, approved, we're really using these products in an off-label basis. He said, third, that given their exorbitant cost, we really should question the use given the high recurrence rates. And lastly, he said, uh, and I think in a very strong way, he said that we need to really reevaluate or actually have a possible moratorium on the use of biologic meshes. And he said that he called for industry-sponsored and public av available registries to help us make these decisions. So all these authors essentially have come up with similar conclusions in that these, these products really aren't supported by the data. They have high recurrence. They're very expensive. And ultimately, I think that uh, we have to use good caution. So I've tried to review basically in summary, tried to review basically the history of abdominal reconstruction to give the current debate some context. I've discussed the history of biologic mesh in abdominal wall reconstruction and discussed recent attempts at systemic reviews of biologic mesh in the contaminated complex abdominal wall reconstruction. So in summary, for me, in my conclusions essentially, uh, what I'm going to say up front is that, that ultimately I'm going to look at it from both sides. So you have a single stage approach, you could remove the contamination, uh, do a component separation, place a biologic mesh in place, and then reinforce it with, with any of these varieties of products. Ultimately, there's benefits. It reduces the stay. It has potentially decreased cost, although there's actually evidence that shows that, that the costs actually are, are actually higher and that you lose money when you do it this way. Uh, but there are su substantial uh, or sorry, sub subjective benefits in that you decrease the, the flap necrosis, the infections, and the recurrence. But I'm not so, you know, so ultimately to me, uh, we need to 
provide caution when we talk about these patients. They're very complex. And, and what I'd say is that in the end, that a multi-stage approach, I'm not so naive to think that in the past that these were really that much better, where you would remove contamination, plan a ventral hernia, ultimately then place a mesh, and, and then reconstruct the patient down the line. These also had high morbidity, had long treatment durations, and high treatment cost. So I think in the end, uh, like any disruptive technology, this biologic mesh has come in. Uh, I think that what will happen in the future is that the, the use of it will wane to a point where a few specialized surgeons will continue to use it and ultimately in, in, in select circumstances until really some new other disruptive technology comes into the marketplace and is able to be used to help take care of these complex patients. So subject to your questions, uh, that concludes my presentation. Thank you.